Welcome to Shirt Making Details Beyond the Basics. I'm David Page Coffin. In this class, we'll go beyond the basic dress shirt construction as we consider details and features that will take your favorite shirt pattern from standard to custom. I'll introduce the idea that shirts are blocks with interchangeable details, which can give you a completely different look, all while allowing you to work from a pattern you know and love. By the end of this class, you'll be on your way to creating classic custom shirts with unexpected details. I'm a former editor of Threads Magazine. I'm based in Brookings, Oregon. I'm also the author of several sewing books, including Shirt Making and the Shirt Making Workbook. But at the heart of it, I'm a geeky sewer who loves figuring out construction details as much as I like reshaping them. We'll start this class by learning about the anatomy of a shirt pattern and how to use mini muslins to explore design details, as well as two easy ways to improve the fit of a shirt. Then we'll explore design and construction of collars with stands, convertible collars, and combination collars. Next, we'll deconstruct sleeve plackets. Then, cover how to shape pockets and other details perfectly with templates. Finally, I'll show how to shape and insert side seam gussets, as well as how to set in a shirt sleeve. You'll find all you need in your class materials, so be sure to download them so you can follow along. I'm here to help, so if you have any questions, please be sure to ask. Let's get started. Even before it ever occurred to me to sew my own clothes, I was interested in shirts, and I also sort of intuitively understood that all the shirts that I had were pretty much the same thing. So uh, that idea has stayed with me and became much more interesting as I became a sewer. Uh, and that's a theme that we're going to return to over and over again in this class. But in this specific lesson, we're going to start with the anatomy of a shirt pattern. We're going to talk about how we can explore details using mini muslins or parts of a pattern. And then we're going to wind up with a little bit on yoke fitting and balance. So let's return to this idea of all shirts being the same. Uh, the thing that became clear to me as a sewer was not just that all the shirts that I had were basically the same. In other words, their body was a, a rectangle and the sleeves were flat, there was no internal structure to them, and the sleeves stuck out from the body at some sort of angle, as opposed to, say, a sport coat where the sleeves are built to be right next to the body. But beyond that, that many of the clothes that I had and liked to wear and didn't think of immediately as shirts were shirts, actually. Bathrobes, pajama tops, Levi jackets, dress shirts, sport shirts, even some kinds of, of raincoat, maybe. Uh, or winter coat, hunting jackets. All of these things really can be looked at as shirts if they have the same sort of simple rectangular body that I'm talking about and as sleeves that are put in at an angle uh, and not much internal structure. So if you take that recognition to uh, the question of what, my, what is my sewing pattern, it became obvious to me that Every shirt pattern that I had was essentially composed of some core details, this, the rectangular shape I'm talking about, some core aspects, I should say, and then a bunch of details. In other words, a specific collar, a specific shape for the sleeve, a specific kind of cuff. So I just wanted to show you what, for me now, is my basic shirt pattern for one style of shirt and one way that I like a shirt to fit. It's specifically shapes with no details and with uh, room left for me to add the details. So here's, here's my back and I have, I have two of them because my shoulders are not symmetrical at all. It's something I didn't ever notice until I became a sewer. Then it became an important issue. That's why I also have two fronts. I have a yoke and we'll talk about yokes later uh, when we're fitting them, but you notice that the yoke here is, even though I have the whole yoke, it's perfectly symmetrical. And then I have a sleeve. Now this may not look like a sleeve to you, but what it captures is a sleeve cap that matches these armholes. And that's really all of the sleeve that I know is going to be the same every time I use this base pattern. So for instance, if you look at a specific pattern, that I've developed for a specific shirt. You can see how the sleeve cap comes from this, this basic uh, 
block, I guess you'd call it, and all the rest of it, all the other shaping. You can see I'm, I'm playing with the, the shaping here as I'm working out this specific design. Even the length of it, the way the cuff is going to go, all of that is detail. And so all I really need to have to capture this basic fit is this part of the sleeve. So I'm calling this the core of the sleeve. And all of this I would call details. And so that's, uh, in terms of the title of this class, we're going to be talking about the details, not so much the core. But I wanted to make sure that we all understood what I mean by the core and uh, how little of it we actually need to capture that. So, for instance, with the, a front, here's the core front, and here are all the details that I added to it by simply tracing off around the manila here, tracing onto a bigger sheet of paper, and then I started drawing the details. And I was basically just playing and thinking. But this is, this is the pattern for a specific garment, and this is the basic block from which all sorts of different garments can come. When it comes to designing a specific garment, uh, I asked myself even if I could reduce my block, my basic fit for a specific basic shirt even further so that I wouldn't have to make a a whole muslin for each new shirt design that I was thinking of. And it seemed pretty clear, for instance, if I was going to do a dress shirt, the main detail would be the collar. And I wouldn't even need any muslin for that. I could just make a sample collar and throw it on my own neck. I, I knew that uh, I had the neckline figured out, and it would be just a question of matching this muslin to the length of my existing neckline. But there are some occasions where uh, I would perhaps like to play with a dress shirt collar open and uh, in other ways than simply pinned at the front. And so I came up with this structure, which I call a, the dress shirt mini muslin. And it simply gives me a way of having my actual neckline to play with in fabric. And it goes, so it goes all the way around the neckline, uh, all the way around my neck. And uh, I can pin things to it. and play around with openings and that sort of thing. But I don't use this very often with dress shirts because, as I say, the real issue is the collar. And that's all I need is the collar. For any other kind of shirt, sport shirt, other kinds of collars that we're going to be discussing in further lessons, I've broken down my fittings and design system to two additional mini muslins. And this one, is nothing more than the yoke from the, my, my pattern and the front part of the, pa of, of the pattern. It captures the unique shape that I have for each shoulder. And it's got my armholes, although they're, they're rarely used. But obviously, it's, it cuts out the middle. Because the middle is where I'm going to be designing and playing. So the, this is a pair with another sort of mini muslin that's just the front neckline that comes from, say, a sports shirt. So that's, that's the basic mini muslin. This would be a specific one on which I've added a specific collar shape. So let me show you how that would, that would work. I would start by putting the collar and the, the sort of in, internal part of the mini muslin pair on. And note, of course, I'm, I'm using a form here, and this is customized to my body. But I could be doing all of this on my body. I don't need a dress form. Obviously, it's a handy thing to have. But uh, I could do all of this on my own body in front of a mirror. So that's the first part. Now, if I slip this, this part on. I don't need this to audition the collar shape here. What I need it for is that when I've got this collar arranged the way I think I want it to be, and I might move it up or down, and I might decide, well, I actually want this to be more open. I don't want it to close 
in the front, so the grain might be adjusted. Whatever I come up with, I can then slip this part on, and now I can see exactly how this shape that I'm designing will merge with my existing pattern, which is represented just by this, this part of the mini muslin. So when everything's the way I like it, these come off, and there's my shirt front pattern. Obviously, I would pin them so that they're not going to move, but there, there is captured the exact relationship between the front of this particular shirt and my existing yoke and armhole. And you'll see me using these mini muslins throughout the subsequent lessons in this class. A shirt doesn't need a yoke to classify as a shirt, uh, but I think the virtues and the benefits of a yoke are so important that I almost always use a yoke on a shirt. And the, the main feature that a yoke provides is, instead of a single shoulder seam, two shoulder seams. In other words, a front one and a back one. And the importance of that is that that's where the fit of the shirt is going to come from. I think the only part of a shirt that you would really say, well, it has to, it has to fit right or it's obvious that it doesn't fit, is how the shirt falls from your shoulders. All the other issues about how tight it is or how long the sleeves are, all those sorts of things, you can have opinions about them, but they're, they're kind of arbitrary. If, but if your shirt isn't hanging right from your shoulders, uh, a knowledgeable sewer is going to spot it instantly as that shirt doesn't fit or I want something different. So that's what we're going to talk about in this part of the lesson, even though this, is, this isn't a fitting class. I think it's important to talk about yokes. And the main thing that I found as I was looking for information about fitting yokes is that every book I saw that even mentioned yokes talked about how well, if your shoulders aren't symmetrical, you have to adjust the yoke to, to match that. And remember that I said in my block pattern that my particular yoke is symmetrical, even despite the fact that my shoulders aren't. And the reason for that is, seems perfectly obvious to me that if I were to adjust my yoke to fit my shoulders, it would come out an asymmetrical shape. It might look great on my body, but if it was cut in any kind of fabric with an obvious pattern, like this plaid, it would immediately be obvious that it was asymmetrical, even if it didn't look it from the outlines. So it seemed to me that an obvious choice would be to make sure that the yoke is symmetrical, so I can cut it in any kind of fabric, and the stripe will be parallel to the edge in the same way on either side even if it's sitting differently on my body. So that's my starting place for any fitting uh, exercise. And the, the, basic, uh, the basic method that I use to come up with a fitting block, you start with something. You've got a pattern that you bought or a shirt you love that you've copied. Uh, and it, you know it doesn't fit exactly right, so you want to tweak this, this shoulder fit. So let's say that we've bought a pattern, and we've got a yoke pattern, and we've got a front and a back with armholes. That's really all we need to take care of uh, to get this shoulder fit. So the place that I would start would be to cut out the yoke from the pattern, symmetrically on the fold, and then arrange this on my self or on, on my form. Uh, if it was on myself, I'd be wearing a t-shirt or something so I could pin to it. And I would be simply evaluating uh, how to get it to look as symmetrical and natural as possible. So it's going to have a little bit of a slope here and back, but it's going to be smooth, and that's the most important thing. The next most important thing for me, because I have a kind of a stooped shoulder or rounded shoulder posture, it becomes important how long the yoke is because uh, there's going to be a there's a breaking point here where uh, if this was a fitted bodice, you know, there'd be a dart going into here. So I don't want the yoke sticking out beyond that. I want to I'm going to shorten it so that the the back edge of the yoke more or less conforms to the place on my shoulder where it goes from being shoulder to being back. On many people, that's not an easy place to define, but on me, it is. So there's my yoke. It's looking good to me. And you'll notice that I've 
pressed an edge under the yoke so that I can uh, clearly define where that seam line is at the front and in the back. Even though I've moved it, I, I can definitely tell where it is. That's a seam line. So then the next step is to take two simple rectangles of fabric, not shaped in any way. And I always use gingham for this because gingham, a woven gingham as opposed to a printed gingham, uh, tells me what the grain is. I can immediately see what the cross grain and the lengthwise grain is, and I can see when it's off. So for each of these rectangles, I've got one for the back and one for the front. I've marked a center line. In back, I don't need anything else besides the center line, and I simply am going to lay this over my yoke with the center of the yoke and the center of my neck uh, aligned. And of course, I'm going to pin into my t-shirt uh, if it's on my body. And then the question is simply, what do I have to do to make sure that this fabric is falling from my shoulders and staying on grain? If I, if I just let it go, that the grain is off. So all I have to do to get the grain back to straight is lift the corners. And because of the specific shape of roundness of my back, there's going to be some folds here, but the important thing is that the crosswise grain is straight. So once I'm satisfied with that, and you can spend as much time as you want fiddling with that or having a friend help you in the mirror, then the only question is, where does the yoke line that I've previously established hit the gingham? And I can feel the fold that I created right through here. So all I have to do is go along here and mark along that fold. And you can mark the ends based on where the, the folds are on your yoke. So this line is telling me this is the back uh, and neck uh, the back and yoke seam line. If I join this piece of fabric to this piece of fabric along this line, it's going to hang like this. In front, I do exactly the same thing, the only difference being that at the center front, I simply slashed into it to allow it to go beyond my neck. So the process is exactly the same. I line up the center front with the center of my body and adjust each corner so that the grain is straight across and straight down. And we'll deal with the neckline in a moment. The first order of business is the shoulders. And again, the same exact process. I can feel through here to feel where the beginning of that yoke is, where that yoke edge is, and simply mark along it. So once again, I've established the grain and I've established the line at which the front has to attach to the yoke to maintain that grain. When it comes to establishing the neckline, the easiest thing I've found is to simply take a, a piece of paper and make a, a cylinder out of it. Something like that. The basic thing I'm trying to achieve here is to have uh, take advantage of the fact that when this is a cylinder, the bottom edge is straight. So seen from the side, I want a straight line. And I want it to be snugged up reasonably closely around my neck. And then 
I simply mark along this edge. to establish the neckline in front and in back. I do the same thing with the yoke. You can see that this yoke, actually I, I cut it too deep. I should have allowed a little bit of extra fabric there so I could do the same marking along the back. So what have I accomplished so far? I now know what my, the top seam line for my back and my front should be. And now all I have to do is go back to my original pattern and transfer the armholes from the pattern to my new shoulder line. I don't want to have to drape the armholes. I'm satisfied with the way the, sh the sleeves and the armholes work from the commercial pattern. So I line up the center front and I find the point at which the armhole starts in relation to this, this side of my, my body and I trace it off. Flip it over, line up the center front again and notice that it's it's higher on this side, but it's the same exact armhole shape that I want. I don't want to have a different size armhole on each side. And there we go. There's my front pattern now. I've got a neckline, shoulders, armhole. I do exactly the same thing in back with the back pattern piece, and we're in business. So let's move on now to uh, what we would next do once we put all these pieces together and have a muslin to try on and see about adjusting the balance. One of my favorite ways of coming up with a shirt pattern is to copy a shirt that I like the fit of. Um, and it's really proven to be a, a successful way of getting a good start. Often I will still have to go through the shoulder adjusting process that I just showed you, but I, before we move on, I wanted to point out something that confused me at first when I first started to copy shirts. A shirt like this, for instance, looks, uh, in terms of wrinkles and the way it falls from my shoulder, as if it fits me pretty well. But notice that the plaid and the top of the pockets are sloping down at an angle. Obviously, the plaid isn't, wasn't woven at an angle. The body that this shirt was designed to fit was something more like this than me. In other words, all, to, I have to raise my shoulders enough to straighten out those pockets. The fact that it doesn't wrinkle is simply down to the fabric. This is a very soft, drapey, heavy fabric so that it easily conforms to my shape and the only tip off is that there's a stripe in it, a stripe across it in those pockets. So this would maybe be a good shirt to copy, but I would absolutely need to do that shoulder adjustment on it to get the plaid straight. Okay, another feature of my particular body and shirts is that when I stand at a normal relaxed position, you can see that I kind of lean backwards from my hips. And so there's a, an angle at my side seam. And I'm perfectly happy with that and it, but the shirts feel like they fit fine. But if you're gonna be paying strict attention to the way the grain is falling, you notice here on this muslin, the grain is also following my body, so it's going at an angle too. There's a simple tweak that will bring that grain back to perfectly vertical, and that is simply to, to along the entire back, to fold up a, a little tuck so that the grain goes straighter. You may not be able to get it completely straight, but at least you're getting uh, more of what a tailor calls balance. When they're fitting a, a suit on somebody, they're definitely concerned to have all the seams and the stripes go completely vertical. So that's all you have to do is take that little tuck. Now, obviously, I'm shortening the armhole by doing that, so all I have to do once I fix uh, get this marked is to go back and retrace the original armhole off because I don't want to mess with the armhole itself. So 
the last thing I'd say about that, this balance point is that it makes sense from a sort of a theoretical position that yes, that we know the grain needs to be like that. But if you're perfectly happy with the grain being off at an angle and you don't want a lot of drape in back, forget it. It's your shirt. You're not, uh, you're not a poster child for the sewing expert. So if you would prefer it not to be balanced, go ahead. So that's it for fitting. That's all I've got on fitting shirts. So let's move on now and the next lesson will be collars with stands.